Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. All right, we are at the Libertarian Christian Institute booth at Freedom Fest, and I'm here with none other than Brian Kaplan, Mr. Open Borders himself. Do you like that name, Brian, Mr. Open Borders? Absolutely. You you love that, right? Yeah. (laughs) You want to call me that? I'll take it. Who had an admirable and amazing performance at the debate last night on uh, Mock Trial. Mock Trial, that's right. I've done a lot of debates. I've never done a Mock Trial before, and now I'm at 100% victory, so (laughs) I like the format. The format's good. Is it good? What is that format like? It was weird because I never got to talk to my opponents. Instead, your lawyer goes and questions you, and then the other lawyer questions you. But I never actually got to talk to the people who were technically the other expert witnesses. Uh, So it was the opposite of a normal debate. Okay, that's really interesting. Well, you also were, so you kind of bookended your day on the main stage, Mm -hmm. uh, I believe. And in the morning, you were on the main stage event titled Resurging Nationalism, Is It a Threat to Human Flourishing? And you Mm -hmm. were on with with Norman Horn from LCI, Rich Lowry, and Nicholas B. Moderated. And that exchange was really amazing. I thought it was great. There was a comment that I want to follow up with (laughs) because I think libertarian Christians sort of can see it both ways. I've heard people see it both ways. And that's a comment about the American Revolution. And Uh Rich Lowry, you took him totally by surprise. um, (laughs) And you were succinct in your answer, which was great because it wasn't obviously the main topic. But he asked you about the American Revolution, whether or not it was even a good idea. And I don't even remember exactly what he said, but Mm -hmm. uh, you were kind of like, yeah, it was better if we hadn't had the American Revolutionary War and just remained Britons. That's true. Well, I mean, if you go down the list of the grievances of the colonists, and then say, hmm, should we spill an ocean of blood over this? I think that the answer of any detached person is gonna be no, of course not. Okay. That's really what it comes down to, right? Like the complaints, things like no taxation without representation. All right, well, so how important is this representation really? Is it really worth having a pile of people lose arms and legs? Is it worth having a bunch of people die or starve to death? Is it worth having a decent share of the country feel like they have to flee the country because they are now enemies in their own land. Okay. And these are all like the You're war. About the loyalists. War, yes, yes, war, yes, loyalists. So, like, war is a terrible thing. If you read All Quiet on the Western Front, there's this very affecting scene in a hospital that just goes through all the ways that war can go and injure a man. Mm-hmm. And you know, a hospital alone shows what war is hospital and a graveyard. And so, yes, I'm very anti war. Like, I'm not an absolutist. It was like, we have to have one tiny war to save the world. All right, let's do it. But (laughs) it's got to be at that level where you've got very high confidence of enormous net gains. And the American Revolution isn't even remotely like that. It's like we fought a war to avoid being Canada. (laughs) <laughs> like how many people, how many That's lives one way is to that put worth? It. I, I think there's a lot of people though that would disagree and say that the American revolution was a unique moment in history that turned mm-hmm. the, like it turned it to the power to the people kind of concept. Uh, uh-huh. the, 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 it overturned the, I know you're just like, well, whatever. Yeah, well, like, like, let me put it this way. If we want to talk about the broader effects, there's another revolution that's a lot less popular that obviously was closely caused by the American revolution. That's the French revolution. It laid Europe to waste for a quarter century Did the American revolutionaries know that would happen? Of course not. But that's what happens when you unleash the dogs of war. Okay. It goes from one horrible thing to another very often. Like, is it possible something really good could have come out of it too? Yeah, it's possible. But look, this is what really happened. It was hell on earth. And all for what? To go and accelerate voting by some small number of years. It's not like there wasn't already voting in the UK. I think that it was pretty clear it was going to happen anyway. And yeah, and since I am the author of The Miss Rational Voter, I'm going to say it's not all that clear that having (laughs) universal voting is that much better than going and just having a traditional rotten British democracy. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you reference to the rotten boroughs and so on. All right. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's like neither system's all that great. It's not worth killing people over. Okay. So you probably realize that somewhat on an emotional level, you're taking something away from people who are they value the Declaration of Independence and the mm-hmm. sort of the spirit of, the, especially the Declaration, but even to some, depending on the libertarian you mm-hmm. talk to, the Constitution and those mm-hmm. kinds of principles. Is there something about those? I mean, John Adams said that the real revolution was in the, mi- the mm-hmm. hearts and minds of Americans. Where do you put yourself in an analysis of that? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd say it's you're totally right. A lot of people have very strong emotional attachments, and especially libertarians. I think the real reason is People want to imagine a time when they fit in in their country. 
libertarians have a hard time doing this. So they have to go back hundreds of years and say, oh, if only I around during the time of the Revolutionary War, then it was a culture of liberty and I would have felt really at home. Why can't it be like that now? Look, I understand the feeling. Of course, people want to fit in. They like to imagine that they are a normal part of their culture. But at some point, you just have to accept that's not really how it was. And history is not there for psychotherapy. History is there to go and just understand what really happened. How was it really? The honest story is that John Adams is right about there's some change in the way that people are thinking. But I don't think it's a libertarian change. It's primarily a change in their national identity. This is what Rich Lowry was really talking about. What's the American Revolution about? It's just the idea, we're not Britons, we are Americans, Americans should rule Americans. And it's like, well, why not just avoid the war and just stop and then just not change your mind about what you are? Have you ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? I have not, no. It's a fantastic movie. Okay. You've got to see it. But in any case, there's a great scene in there where Lawrence is going and talking to all the disparate Arab tribes, and he basically says... You're all Arabs. Why can't you unite together to go and fight the Turks? And I'm thinking, why couldn't he just as well have said, you're all Ottoman citizens. There's no reason for you to be fighting anyone. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, folks, I just want to take a break from our episode to not do an advertisement because we don't do advertisements, although I guess you could call this an advertisement. I'm going to ask you to consider becoming an LCI insider. We want everyone to feel engaged and excited about what LCI is doing. And the best way to do that is if you become a monthly supporter at $20 or more per month, you will become what we're calling our LCI insiders. You get some free gifts. You get an exclusive Crisis King magnetic lapel pin. They give you two copies of Faith Seeking Freedom. We send monthly ebooks months ahead of when they're released on our public website. You can get discounts on our swag on our online store, and you get exclusive invites to our quarterly live streams with the LCI staff. In addition to that, whenever we do publish something like a physical book like Strangers with Candy, we'll also send you those as well. So the best way to stay up to date on what we're doing and to support what the Libertarian Christian Institute is doing, including supporting the podcast you're listening to right now, is to become an LCI insider. So to do that, go to libertarianchristians.com slash donate and then choose recurring monthly gift and you'll be added to our list automatically. Thank you for your support and I'll let you get back to the podcast. I think that, and this is true of me, even though I can totally see your point, but is there something about the mythos of the American founding that if you just say, okay, well, we didn't need a war, but we could still have the mythos of we are standing up for or there's some sort of instantiation of classical liberalism? And it probably makes some people feel better in terms of whether it's even effective. I mean, I would say that invoking the founders is at this point such a niche rhetorical mm -hmm. move. I don't think it really accomplishes much. I would agree with much. that. There's no yeah, risk. Yeah, yeah, most people are like, who are the what founders? The founders, who the hell are they? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like George Washington. I mean, like, I would always say that the first thing in history is seek truth. Like, the honest truth is that yeah. there were a whole bunch of what one historian called the slave-holding philosophers of freedom among the founding fathers. You can call that a cheap shot. It's not a cheap shot. Okay. It was ridiculous for these people owning slaves to be talking about standing up for freedom. They wanted to stand up for freedom. How about you free your slaves? Yeah, okay. So, you know, I'm from Virginia, which is you know the hotbed yeah, of this right. ridiculous hypocritical rhetoric. Now you could say, all right, fine, they were hypocrites, but what they're saying is good too. I mean, like my honest view is that when someone talks about freedom, unless they know a lot of economics, they don't trust them. Because economists, when they hear freedom, they're like, so that means like I can open a barbershop without a license? Right. That means that I can go and hire workers $5 an hour if they're agree agreeable to it? Right. That means I can build my skyscraper without getting a piece of paper? Right. Normal people, when you say freedom, it's so vague as to what it even means to them. It's really important to, for to me to say that when a political thinker just waves around the flag of freedom, you got to pin them down and say, hold on, freedom to do what? Okay. Right. And the economists are very good at this, even left wing economists. When a left wing economist talks about freedom, they realize that they're opening a can of worms they don't like. And that's why it's better to talk to them about it because they are nervous. Whereas normal people, like, there's plenty of Marxist Leninists who've waved a flag of freedom. Herbert Marcuse, founder of a lot of critical theory, really, really maybe founder of yeah, critical sure. theory. 
he said he was fighting for human freedom. And what does that mean? Well, the freedom to not to yep. have to work for your money, the freedom to have everybody respect you, the freedom to yeah, go, you know, right, you know, so right, the freedom right. to have co the culture be exactly the way you want to be, the freedom for people like him to rule totalitarian dictatorships. That's what freedom means to them. So yeah, it's a word that's just so vague that I just don't give people a lot of credit for saying it. You've got to give me specifics okay. or else I just don't trust you. So what are your specifics when you say you believe in freedom? Well, I guess I would just start with some of the things I was mentioning, but yeah, like, you know, the top freedoms that are neglected right now, you know, the freedom for people to live and work in whatever country they want, the freedom to go and build structures on your own property without having neighbors have a say in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. See, the freedom to build nuclear power plants, right? These are, <laughs> these are freedoms that are very unpopular, and yet these are what I say are the difference between the mediocre policies that we're stuck with right now yep. and a libertarian transformation of our economy and society to the world of an incredible future that is available right now using what we know if yes. people, <laughs> government would just get out of the way yeah, yeah right we need to power the world with nuclear power nuclear power is so energy awesome energy is so important <laughs> yes right well, if you would never heard of nuclear power you would think it's science fiction and then it's like no it's real and it was discovered almost 100 years ago and we barely use we've it we've seen the future and it works government <laughs> we've seen the future and government won't let it work yes that's a good way to think about it did you still want to talk about mexico Oh, yeah. Okay, let's do that. So there was a comment that Rich Lowry made that I wasn't yeah, able to fully follow because I was taking... A rhetorical question. Yes, Rory. it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> well, more, I guess, no, more of a challenge. It wasn't rhetorical. He wanted an answer. Yes, he did. And I was taking photography, and so I was, like, working on that. So what did Rich Lowry say, and mm -hmm. how did you respond? Right. I was saying that the only time that it's worth getting a new country is if you actually have much better ideas about how to improve policy that you can only do if you get independence and if it doesn't require horrible bloodbath. Those are two conditions. <laughs> okay. So I'll say, yeah, like Baltic independence. The Baltic countries really did seem much more likely to go a lot further away from communism than Russia did. And they actually were able to get independence during a time that it didn't require a horrible civil war. So yes, go Baltics, great. So, so strike while the, the, while the iron is hot. But he wanted to say, no, no, it's not primarily about do you have better ideas. And then his thought experiment was, imagine that we could be ruled by Mexico. And he admitted like, this was crazy, but he still said, but imagine that they just had way better policy ideas than us. Could you get behind that? And I said, totally, <laughs> totally. If it's really the case that Mexicans have much better policy ideas than us, I'm happy to go and have them adopt. The Mexicans are going to go and legalize nuclear power, deregulate it. <laughs> like, I, I, like, I will just say, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, viva la Mexico. You know, like, <laughs> like, 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 I mean, I cannot imagine how thrilled I would be by this. And he just thought, no, no, no. People would, could not be happy being ruled by some alien power. And I was like, look, people can totally there get used to this stuff. There are examples of that. Right. In fact, then this went on to a discussion of allegedly how miserable people were when they were part of, like, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I said, like, that is just completely made up. It is not true that normal people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire are sitting around saying, like, damn it, I'm a Slovenian. I should be living in an independent Slovenia. It's just a few intellectuals, troublemakers, people that are honestly mostly looking to rule a new country who are frozen out of the power structure unless there's a horrible bloodbath of a civil war and then they can go and swim through the ocean of blood and sit on the throne at the end. Okay, that's what okay. nationalism is really about. So right? in, no, normally, not in every case, but normally that's what's going on and that stuff is terrible. And don't imagine those people speak for the people. They don't. They speak for themselves. After they're ruling and they brainwash people, then it's like, I couldn't imagine not being Slovenian, but that's not true that before for independence, people were having bad days all the yeah. time. So they, history they were, is yeah. written by the victors, yes, but, yes, exactly. but, history written by the victors. but it's instigated by the activists. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. we could go with you that. You got it. Bingo. Okay. All right. Well, Brian, I love your perspective on things because you don't just have random ideas. You've thought through everything you say. I do try. Yeah. Well, and you're a good thinker and you have a, a number of books that have influenced me. Myth of the Rational Voter probably influenced me a significant cool. amount. I mean, it was quite a while ago. It's We're going on, what, a decade or more? More than that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's geez, 16 years. Yeah. I'm still using some of the questions that, you know, the I guess it was the survey questions that nobody could get accurate. Like, how much do we spend on foreign policy? Yeah, and it's yeah. always overblown. I use that as conversations with people to help them understand mm -hmm. why I don't vote mm -hmm. or why I don't always vote. All right. <laughs> and, then, and then they they're like, oh, OK, well, really? Wait, I've actually told somebody you don't want me voting in this midterm election or whatever, because I don't know any of the candidates, so I would be irresponsible to vote. And they're like, 
well, what's wrong with you? I'm like, well, I'm being responsible. I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't compute for them. <laughs> All right. Brian, I really appreciate this conversation. Thank you for being part of our panel you know, on the fun. nationalism panel. And thanks for having this conversation to uh, pick your brain about the revolution. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. 